Good evening, Brown community and everyone else tuning in tonight from wherever in the world you may be. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the fourth in our series of Brown Fashion Week talks, which are being broadcast live from the campus of Brown University here in historic Providence, Rhode Island. I'm Sasha Pinto, the president of Fashion at Brown, and tonight we are exceedingly honored to welcome the legendary Kenneth Cole to Brown Fashion Week. And as a special treat, Kenneth's daughter, Amanda, who we're proud to say is a 2012 Urban Studies graduate of our own beloved Brown, will be moderating the talk. But first, I am delighted to turn the Zoom mic over to Fab's Vice President, Emma Rosenkranz, who will tell us a little bit more about Amanda Cole to get us started. So Emma, over to you. Thank you so much, Sasha, and good evening, everyone. Amanda Cole has worked as a human potential coach, a storyteller, social entrepreneur, and impact strategist, helping leaders and organizations harness purpose to drive sustainable change. Amanda is a founding partner at Per Capita, a financial services social enterprise whose mission is to create financial opportunity, inclusion, and equity. Previously, she worked to develop corporate social responsibility strategy at Kenneth Cole Productions. Amanda has co-founded several nonprofits and campaigns to build community, drive collaboration, and make sustainable impact in the mental health, AIDS, and youth civic engagement spaces, while serving on the board of several wonderful organizations, including Help USA, Young Professionals, A Better Life Foundation, and the Mental Health Coalition and Social Impact 360. We are so delighted and so honored to have Amanda moderating this event tonight. Um, thank you so much and back to you, Sasha. Thank you, Emma. And now it's my great honor to introduce Kenneth Cole and my goodness, where do we start? In 1982, Kenneth Cole creatively launched his business out of the back of a 40 foot trailer truck. And today he's at the helm of a billion dollar lifestyle brand. But of course, that's only part of the story. We also all know and love Kenneth Cole as a social activist and visionary who has built his company around the belief that business and philanthropy are interdependent. And for over 35 years, he has leveraged his passion and platform to make a meaningful impact in underserved communities. Back in 1987, in the very early days of AIDS, he joined the board of the American Foundation for AIDS Research, better known as AMFAR, and was appointed the chairman in 2004. And under his leadership, AMFAR contributed significantly to, to breakthroughs in AIDS research, treatment, and prevention. And in response to this extraordinary work, the United Nations General Assembly appointed him as a UN AIDS International Goodwill Ambassador in 2016 to help achieve the goal of ending AIDS as a public health crisis by 2030. But Kenneth Cole doesn't stop there. In 2010, after the devastating earthquake in Haiti, he responded by opening the Kenneth Cole Haiti Health Center in Cité Soleil to provide healthcare to one of the most undeserved, un underserved areas in the Western Hemisphere, reaching over 1 million and a half Haitians in need. And then in 2020, in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, Kenneth launched an initiative to address what is arguably an even larger larger pandemic, mental health. And he brought together the nation's mental health experts and organizations to form the Mental Health Coalition to change the dialogue and end the stigma surrounding the subject of mental health. And I have to add that everything I just mentioned really only touches the surface of the countless remarkable public health and civil liberty initiatives that Kenneth Cole has undertaken. So suffice it to say, if this were a live audience, I know you'd all be on your feet applauding by now. So won't you please join me in a virtual standing ovation to welcome our remarkable guests, Kenneth and Amanda Cole. Before Amanda takes this, I just want to thank both of you. Uh, Emma, that was very, that was a terrific um, introduction um, of, a, of, a, of a Amanda and I'm sure she'll acknowledge as such, but I, if I need, if I, if I need a press agent, I'm assuming uh, I can find you, um, Sa Sasha, someplace. But what you two have done, first of all, is, is extraordinary, and it's so difficult to get so much done today. But to have been able to pull together so many, um, uh, focus on a very specific agenda and message um, that is truly uplifting and inspiring at a time when we all need it so badly, um, is tr a tribute. So thank you. 
for what you apparently you do all the time, which I don't know how the hell you do, but, and thank you for tonight. Well, oh my goodness, you were, you were too kind and thank you for joining us. Let me just start by saying how incredibly generous is you to be here at Brown Fashion Week. We really appreciate it. All right. Well, wonderful. And now that we're all here, I just like to let our audience know that if anyone has a question for Mr. Cole, please just write it in the chat box below because Amanda will be checking it on air to try and ask as many questions as possible. So with that, we will leave you two to get started. So thank you again and um, bye for now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Emma and Sasha. Um, and yes, if I, we would we would love to take you on the road to um, to sort of articulately, you know, be able to um, to to share things about ourselves that that I, I know that um, that we can't say as as well as you did. So happy International Women's Day, everybody! Um, I wanted to first just call attention to that and to the fact that. Um, there are, this is a fun fact, 75 million people employed in the fashion industry and 80% of them are women. 80% of the 75 million people employed by the fashion industry are women. So therefore fashion is really an incredible vehicle that is often actually the first step out of poverty for so many of these women. And you know the global reach and the cultural influences that fashion has is just so profound. And even the smallest changes can have rippling effects. Um, and today the fashion industry launched um, Fashion Makes Change, which is an industry-wide initiative that delivers women's empowerment and climate action in tandem with some of the most incredible brands in the industry, including Kenneth Cole. And it's an uh, opportunity for you to round up on your purchases and then the proceeds go towards um, education for women. And um, it's real, it's the industry's largest effort to educate and empower women a really big way. So we wanted to, to call that out um, and let's get into it. So. The first most important story that I always encourage my dad to tell um, is the story of how the company was started. So, cause I think it speaks to such a um, entrepreneurial spirit to creativity and resourcefulness um, in a time that has odd parallels actually to the one we're in. So can you tell us the story of how? I will. <clears throat> I will thank thank you, Amanda. Um, you know, one last thing too. I just realized I had here had written down not to, and I don't want to overlook acknowledging uh, Adrian Morris. Apparently, it was the faculty advisor who has inspired so much of this as well. So thank you. So I, um, just to give you context of when I started the business and, and the circumstances surrounding it, because it is oddly similar to today in certain certain ways. It was 1982, 83. We were in the middle of a recession. And there was, um, we were on the verge of a pandemic, um, which would be define itself in the, in the few years that um, came to, um, to pass. So I had a little bit of money and, and I knew that um, I had very little time. And most startup businesses then, like today, fail in the first six months, if not by certainly within the first year, because people invariably underestimate the time it takes to have a return on that cash and the costs it, it, it incurred in, um, in getting a business to a certain, to that certain point. So I knew I needed to move quickly and I needed, it wasn't Google in those days, the olden days. So I um, went with my own name because I couldn't take a chance of, of coming up with one and hoping and finding out a year from that point that it was um, not available and there were conflicts. And so, and you can, one could usually get their own name registered. Um, and I knew it would make my mother happy. So I set up, I set up Kenneth Cole um, Inc. Um, and I ran to Italy knowing I had a better chance of getting credit from an Italian shoe factory that needed business than from an American bank that didn't. And I designed a cool line of lady shoes. I came back and I had to sell it. And, um, and I knew um, that essentially I had two choices in the shoe industry at the time. You could take a room at the Hilton Hotel, which was um, about 1,100 companies, and there was 30 some odd companies per floor, and um, and the and the um, 
uh, and the buyers would walk around door to door and they would um, express their interest. Um, not a very good way to define oneself, plus not without cost. And then the other option was to take a big fancy showroom within a two block radius of the Hilton Hotel, which clearly I didn't have the time, the money or the resources. So on a whim, I called a friend in the trucking business and I said, if I could figure out how to park one of your 40 foot trailers on the corner of 6th Avenue and 56th Street um, on December 2nd, that's fashion, it's uh, shoe show week, um, right in front of one of the biggest fancy showroom buildings, um, would you lend it to me? And he said, sure, jerk, I'm happy to lend it to you, but you can't park a bicycle in New York for two, um, for, for 10 minutes, let alone a truck for three days. If I can figure out how to do it, will you lend it to me? If you can figure out how to do it, I'll help you decorate it. So I called the mayor's office with Mayor Koch at the time. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, how does one get permission to park 40 patrol in the corner of 6th Avenue and 56th Street? The answer is, sorry, son, they don't. Um, in New York, we can we get permission only to circumstances if you are a utility company servicing the st our streets, AT&T or Con Ed, or if you're a production company shooting a full-length motion picture, um, uh, because we're going through an I Love New York campaign then, and we probably still are today. So I said, thank you, Mr. Mayor, hung up the phone. Wasn't actually the mayor. But, um, and that afternoon, went to a stationery store, changed the letterhead from Kenneth Cole Inc. to Kenneth Cole Productions Inc., filed for a permit the following morning for permission to shoot a full-length motion picture called The Birth of a Shoe Company. Uh, we opened for business uh, 10 days later, week 10 days later, um, and uh, compliments to Mayor Koch. We had two policemen as our doorman, and we had a, um, a cameraman. Sometimes there was film in his camera, sometimes there wasn't. And we had stanchions and we had click lights, and, um, and we saw every buyer in New York over the course of the next two and a half days. Um, and the more important they were, the longer we made them wait. And we sold 40,000 pair of shoes um, in the back of that truck. And I tell that story because, actually I didn't tell for a while, and then I told it when we went public 10 or 15 years later, because it's the importance, I think it speaks to the importance of resourcefulness and problem solving, and that the best solution is rarely the most expensive, it's almost always the most creative. So um, that was how the business ensued. And, um, uh, and the business grew quickly and we, um, we did things in ways others wouldn't and arguably couldn't and maybe shouldn't. And um, it was about a year or two into that, um, actually two years into that was when the, uh, the, this pandemic was really overwhelming all of us in, in very profound ways. And it was this very dark cloud. And, um, and it was HIV and nobody would talk about it. Nobody could talk about it because if you did, you were presumed to be at risk, which meant you were either an intravenous drug user, you were Haitian um, or you were gay. And none of which were socially acceptable um, in those times. Ronald Reagan, who was the president of the United States didn't mention the word AIDS publicly till 40,000 people had already died. And um, so we launched a campaign, Annie Leibovitz, photographed it and we had some of the biggest models in the, in the industry agreed to be part of it. And um, they spoke about the fact that nobody would speak about HIV. In fact, it was an anti-stigma message. Um, and, and it changed me. And I look back at that moment in time, it changed me, it changed the man, it changed the brand, it changed the company um, in, in profound ways. And I realized that, um, that if we could make what we did part of something bigger than what it was in the ordinary course, then um, we can inspire ourselves, our associates, the marketplace in ways we never could otherwise. And, um, and everything becomes profoundly more meaningful. And, um, and that I've been on that road. Um, and I was, you know, at Amphar, we, I believe had a very big impact in millions of people's lives. I think millions of people today are alive because of some of the research we did at Amphar. And it was creative the way we funded the research, which is could be maybe for another conversation we could all have. And um, and uh, and I had stepped away from it about two years ago for myriad of reasons. And then um, there, there was all these mental health conversations, and people had said, you know, one in two hundred people today still live with HIV, which is which is about thirty-seven million people in the world, which is a lot of people, but one in four people live with mental health conditions, according to WHO. 
and two thirds of whom do it in the shadows. And, um, and the stigma arguably surrounding mental health conditions is what it was with HIV 20 years ago. So is there any way you would consider kind of bringing resources in your company to this um, crusade? So I initially, um, I don't want to spend the whole time talking about well, this, but I saw it. Go to an in again. Say, originally, just, so we, the, especially the work with mental health, we want to make sure to really um, not skim over and go into um, in depth. Okay. But this is a crowd of people who have a lot of fashion questions. So I want to get to the heart of some of um, some of the fashion. So. Well, to the point that you just, um, you know, that you just shared is that you birthed the company and then really quickly found its social conscience. And, um, and you have managed to grow that social conscious and grow, grow the business at the same time. And you've now been in business for let, close to 40 years. And not many people can say that. So what would you say? I was, I was seven. I was seven years old when I started. What would you, what would, what do you attribute your success to? Um, you know, can you give some big picture thoughts that some, some tweetable thoughts that enabled you to get here? So I don't know if they're tweetable, but uh, you know, the business, what I love about the fashion business is that, um, is that it's very interpretive. It's very personal and it changes every day. And, and fashion, by definition, what's fashion, fashionable to you may not be to me. What's fashionable to you today may not be tomorrow. So, you know, it's a very dynamic business that moves so quickly. And you, you, you invariably find yourself years later sleepless and not sure how you got from point A to point B. But it's very invigorating. And every day you're only as good as what you have to offer at that moment in time. So I've looked to figure out how to shortcut that a little bit and um, and uh, how to build aspects of the business that are reasonably reliable. Um, and years ago, I used to, I believe that point of difference between me and the 1100 other shoe companies that were at the Hilton Hotel that day was my brand. And my brand was everything. And I had to make it have a very distinct, meaningful point of difference. And it and a brand is only a brand to the degree that it delivers on that point of, on that message consistently in, in every classification and every geography. Um, but also, what's changed so significantly over the years is that today everyone is their own brand. And um, and I believe every that most of you guys, you wake up in the morning and you curate your own brand on your social feed, on your on your Instagram, on your TikTok, on your Twitter, and then now do you tw do you curate the content, but you curate your audience and you decide who's going to have access to your brand. Um, who, who do you let in, who do you not let in? So um, so now my role is different. Now I have to hope that you'll allow me to be part of your brand rather than kind of entice you to want to define yourself by mine. Um, I'm going to pause in case that you can go to somewhere else. But I, there's been, I mean, we're, we're, it's we don't sleep a lot and um, I love what we do and, and every day, it, you know, you, I, I, what I do is I essentially put myself in the proverbial shoes of the person with whom I want to connect and in the hope that they'll then want to put themselves in mind, um, pun intended. Um, but that's a big part of what the journey is. And because, you know, and to try to just relate to people, to your audience. And, uh, and, and I, and I, I, and, it, and it's, and, and it's so fast moving and, um, but it's, it's extraordinarily invigorating. And I mean, the way that the world has changed in your 30 to 40 years in business is profound. I mean, the way that the world, when I started working with you, we had a full um, advertising department, you know, and we hadn't even, opened, I think there was like a, not even a Twitter account. One of my first projects as an intern when I was in college was, researching what other brands were doing with Twitter. Um, so how do you how do you forecast, understand the changes that are happening in the world and the way that they are currently, you know, or um, could affect your business in the near future? So change and a business strategy. 
you know, <clears throat> you know, a, a metaphor that I often use in business is that if, if we all agree, for example, that we want to be in Los Angeles next Sunday, then let's make sure we know what Los Angeles looks like so that when we get there. And at the same time, let's agree we better be in St. Louis by Wednesday and Denver by Thursday. Um, not Providence and not um, Chicago and not Dallas and not uh, Miami. So, um, and what is the path to, to achieve that? So, you know, I have and we have a very clear sense of what, what makes the brand, um, gives the brand a reason to exist and, and what, is the, what is the inherent um, needs of the marketplace. And, um, and, and I do believe that the, the key is to, is to always know the um, competitive universe. And people are, are, are stifled by the global realities today of the business because everybody, um, everybody uh, has access, uh, every, everybody anywhere is a competitor because I, everybody anywhere has access to the same customers that I have access to through the internet. And which has changed, it, it dynamically changed uh, the business um, as everybody knows. So, um, but at the same time, um, so as a consumer, you have access to all products everywhere. And, and as a company, I've, I've got access to all consumers everywhere. So I look at it kind of on, on the other side. And a brand today, if it's, it's viable anywhere, it's viable everywhere because of the global realities um, of the business today. So, um, and, uh, um, so, and, and so the key sometimes is to be out, out into the world and have a sense of what's there and, and the hope that um, you can see what isn't. And, and that's sometimes the hardest thing to see. And, um, and then you also, I do believe, need a, a, a reason to exist. So everybody, everybody's closets everywhere, I've come to believe, are full. And so you've got to motivate people to make room in their already crowded closets for what it is that you have to offer from one season to the next. And that's the challenge. And it's a, it's a good one. Well, and speaking of change, you know, however much, um, you know, competitive analysis and even forecasting, you know, about new trends that you've done, it's very hard to predict the way the pandemic would have affected our realities. So this week marks one year, right? Since the COVID pandemic changed the way we live and work um, in every way. So the fat and the fashion industry in particular, in particular was definitely hit incredibly hard, especially with retail. What advice do you have for a Zoom room full of students who are interested in fashion um, in a, in a, world where a pandemic is a reality? You know, I think that everybody's lives were, are in upheaval at this moment in time. Everybody's trying to figure out what is life in the um, PC world, which have we refer to it, the post COVID world kind of look like. And, um, and I, I do believe that the world will never again be the way it was. We have to first accept that. And the world will never again be the way it is. And this is the new normal, but the, what we need to focus on is what is going to be the next normal, and and where is the opportunity to, and where what is what is Los Angeles, what is it going to look like, and and what and how do we ultimately um, um, bring value to people's lives, and what's our reason to exist, um, and and I do believe that there is a lot of opportunity in, in adversity, and and over the years our business has always done well in difficult times. Because people in tough, in good times, people just want to do what they're doing and do more of it. It's, and it's only when things are difficult that they want to reimagine, reconfigure, um, and uh, um, and re and uh, reconstruct that which they've taken for granted. And um, and I think this is a, a a time when resourcefulness and resilience and creativity um, come to bear, and that's something that uh, a is inherent. In the fashion business by nature. So I do think the fashion industry goes on. The fashion industry not only survives but thrives. And um, and I think it's uh, you know it's incumbent upon all of us to figure that out. And and um, uh, and I do think that today we're kind of in a more of a feel good rather than a look good 
phase, you know, in, in, in as, as from an inspirational point of view. And um, I think we are, our value equations changed a lot. And, uh, and, and, uh, um, and I, and I think that uh, that can manifest itself in how we um, introduce ourselves to the marketplace. So bringing purpose into your business model, as we've touched on, has been a real differentiator for you, especially for the brand over the years. Um, and today it's in so many ways like a requirement that brands are aware of the way, you know, the, the, the social issues that matter to them and to their customers and that they are also aware of the impact that they have um, on the world. And today you can sniff out like a lack of authenticity really, really easily. You know, you can't just tack on a cause to a brand. Um, so why, so what prompted you to really feel like you needed to bring that purpose into business? Um, especially when you did so in a way where you use your marketing platform um, for something which, you know, you were one of the first brands um, that, that did what we call today cause-related marketing, which hopefully will actually become a term of the past. Um, because as you say, to the degree it's marketing, it sort of undermines actually the real impact of what you're doing. It has to be authentic, it has to be real. So why did you feel it was so important to bring that into your business? Um, and not just into your marketing platform, but also into your business. And especially in ways that, you know, especially using your brand to talk about issues that were not only sort of um, on the fringe or risky or stigmatized, but actually like statistically um, very unpopular for the majority of, um, of, of people in the US, such as a woman's right to choose, uh, same-sex marriage at the time. So, um... So, you know, over the years, I, I've, I've struggled a little bit with, with what I do. First of all, I don't think anybody can be successful at anything today unless they give so much of themselves. They bring so much of themselves to it. And not just it, 40 hours a week and then at home doesn't ever, I don't think does it in any career. Um, and I think you have, to, most, you have to bring so much to something. And then at the end of the day, it, you, it, absent of it being meaningful other than just a paycheck at the end of the week, it's very hard to do that, and it's very hard to build that um, that joint um, um, uh, commitment and devotion within an organization. I believe, and and I've always and also what I do is very fleeting. Um, I mean, hem lengths and heel heights and this fabric or that fabric and um, and this silhouette of person that silhouette. I mean, it's here today, it's literally gone tomorrow. So how do I make it meaningful? And I do believe that, and I've often said that what you stand for um, needs is in fact more meaningful than what you stand in. And to be aware is more important than what you wear. And I, and I, um, and I believed it then, I believe it even more now. And, um, and in the difference before, and, I, and you've actually taught me a lot of this, Amanda, too, over the years. In the past, it was just about doing um, social impact work. It was just doing philanthropy at the time. Today is social impact work, and not and it and it isn't enough that you're doing it. You have to be able to articulate that impact, and and it has to be real. So because um, people will see right through it otherwise. So in many ways, it, that you know you're really held accountable, um, which I think is is a really good thing, and um, uh, and and I think that you know how do you. Um, and, and, and how do you do that? And at the same time, how do you do that in, in the spirit of everything else you do? And that's where it's hard. You know, I've tried to intersect, um, you know, personally, I was committed to, like, to business. I wanted a career, we all do. Um, and I also wanted um, to serve the community in some ways that we don't all necessarily do that, but many of us do. And I also, you know, was, uh, uh, wanted to somehow stay close to my family. So in an optimal scenario, I came to realize if I could somehow do what I do with members of my family and at the same time make social impact part of the business in the ordinary course, then um, um, one plus one will equal much more than two, um, maybe even 11. Um, so, uh, and, and that 
doesn't uh, and that doesn't and, 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 and hasn't changed. And something that you actually, so my dad said since, um, I mean, since the late nineties that I remember that business and fashion, that, that community is the proverbial hand that feeds business. Um, and that all businesses will get there, whether they're, uh, you know, their hearts get them there or their balance sheets do. And I think we're seeing, and hopefully it's the former instead of the latter. Um, and I think we're seeing this moment where it is really becoming almost a, a business imperative to, to do your best. So when, so I want to talk about what this was like for you to adjust to a world where it was really important to always, of course, use your brand's platform to talk about important things and make a real difference to reconciling how that, um, what that looked like when your company was trying to address issues such as um, the environment or diversity and inclusion or mental health. Um, because I know that a, a not fear, maybe not worry, but a con concern, a light fear um, was that, well, we could never um, when we would talk about like what it meant to when we were really looking at operationalizing sustainability into the supply chain and into everything um, into the culture at Kenneth Cole. Um, I know a concern you had was we will never to be a really sustainable company, we should shut our doors, you know, we'll never be you know, sort of the most green, there'll always be this ability to poke holes in, in what we're doing. Um, and to this, in, in the same vein, you know, there'll always be a way to be more diverse, more equitable, more inclusive. Um, and two, with mental health, there's constantly a higher bar um, to meet when it comes to how to take care of your employees. So what, what was this shift in understanding that it's more about the journey versus um, the journey of the, the, the impact um, versus being able to stake a claim to something? Well, you know, in business, you've got a myriad of um, stakeholders and masters that you need to serve um, at the end of the day. And profitability is one of them. I mean, absent of that, you can't pay your rent. You can't, you can't pay your uh, meet the payroll and you can't stay in business so um so the three filters are three corporate filters today anyway specifically is agility um relevance and profitability um so and um and i think that uh and, you know and that's evolves and that changes and um and and uh, and then if you speak into a global audience or then, you know, what's relevant here is necessarily relevant there. And um, so, um, but I do find that the social platform is a, becomes a common denominator in many ways because fashion isn't, fashion is so transient and, and just seasonalities are different. And obviously North of the equator and South of the equator seasons are different and what you can bring to market when and, how things fit some people versus other people. It's a very hard business. So um, sustainability is a very hard um, uh, bar. Um, and so, because, you know, to, to become, a, a, you know, a, 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 um, a fully sustainable, have a building, have a, have a, um, a footprint that is in fact carbon neutral and does everything that it's supposed to do almost becomes cost prohibitive today, although it's becoming much more affordable today than before. So the goal is to go as far as you can, to the degree that you can, the circumstances that you can. Um, um, and, and then as time goes along, maybe you know, it, you're able to go further. But um, I've always you know, tried to, you know, we, in Haiti, we wanted to, you know, this population was devastated. They were they were the poorest, most underserved population in, 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 in this hemisphere before the earthquake, which which was so overwhelmingly devastating and displaced several million people and took upwards of a half million lives. So, um, and now that comes. So 
our goal was how do we impact the most people with the limited resources? And because um, because whatever you have, it's limited in the scope of, of the reality of the heart wrenching reality of what you see when, when you go down there. So we settled on on funding a healthcare center which had the ability to serve this community, which did not have the you know which could provide provide not just HIV but uh, but malaria and and uh, cholera tests and and uh, and treatments and uh, so um, and that's what what we try to do and um, I try to do it in business and I try to do it um, in, in life which want to make a, a, a meaningful impact to people that's hopefully sustainable. So we are getting a lot of fashion questions in the chat right now. It's okay. We can do that. Um, and this is one that I I have always been curious about since I was um, since I was young. And I remember looking at all the shoes and sneakers in your closet and, um, and that some of them would, and I remember some, sometimes even today, you'll go and you'll pull a pair out because it becomes inspiration for what you're working on now. Um, so the question is how, you know, how many, how do styles coming back through the years, fashion history repeats itself, fashion repeats itself. Um, can you speak to any of like the core, any core styles or trends that you've seen come back um, and how you keep your eye open for those trends? So, well, I think today things come back, but they rarely ever come back the way they were. So a lot of uh, silhouettes and shapes and, and looks that we loved over the years and we don't want to get rid of them, so we keep them in the closet. And maybe we wear them again, maybe we don't. But at the end of the day, I mean, technology today has, has changed um, the apparel and the footwear business because you can infuse all these qualities into a garment or into um, a, so a shoe construction to the sole or otherwise. And, um, and it makes the experience unequivocally um, preferable. And today, especially post COVID, I, I don't think people are not going back to be wearing less than comfortable um, um, shoes and, uh, and clothes. And I mean, somebody asked me to describe uh, 2023 words and I said, um, blood, sweatpants and tears. Um, so, but I do think that we went through a lot, but we're not giving up um, that which has, I, I, so fast anyway, I think people are gonna wanna be comfortable. and. And how do you allow them now to, how do you infuse that into clothes that and, and uh, accessories that look right in the workplace and, um, and that are comfortable and um, go when you go, breathe when you breathe, temperature controls and all these other qualities. So our intention now is to infuse technology into every product we make, build a more classic wardrobe that is somewhat um, less, uh, that is more, more uh, less, uh, seasonal and um, but yet modern and contemporary and at the same time um, with elements of functionality that you couldn't do in the past which I believe is a reason for, to again that give me a reason to, to make room for you in my closet because um, I, I don't have any so and, and the answer is neither do I so that's our goal and that's that, that's what we try to do um, one other thing too is um, I do our I, 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 our, one of our missions uh, is to, um, is to, uh, um, is to focus on um, improving the planet and the lives and the physical and mental health of its inhabitants. So that is kind of our bigger agenda now in, in post COVID. And, uh, and I think we're all recognizing how fragile our lives are, how fragile our, the planet is and our lives on it, in it, and, uh, and our physical and, and uh, as well as our mental health. We just got a question perfectly timed in that asked by Kim, um, if you were to look into the future, what CSR, corporate social responsibility topic, do you think will be of the most importance to the fashion industry? Um, I have well, an answer. I, I, what would your uh, answer? What are you guys? 
you know, actually, what I should do is um, what I would, I would probably answer. I would probably answer what I what I just said before too. Yeah. I do think I think this is sustainable. I think we're all realizing how fragile everything is today, and um, and I do think that the well being of the planet and the mental and physical health of its inhabitants is is critical. And I and I more than ever. And I and post pandemic, I think that's we're all we're all understanding that. And I think social justice is 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 paramount. And um, uh, and it's something we have always stood for and, and always will. But um, our focus short term is going to be on what, what I had just said. But thank you for that question. Yeah. But you know. Um, well, but and and to that, because you know, I think you're you're about to to try that. You're about to ask me some questions I that are I on this topic. But I do think that um, to I love the way that you phrase that that well being right? So there's your health, like what is your health? And you can't really just take, like sustainability is about the, is about wellness, is about, um, you know, full picture health. Um, and you can't just take your environmental footprint, but ignore the, the needs and then the well-being of the people, you know, who are powering your business. Um, so I think that, I think that, I mean, in the last 10 years, even business has become so much more humanized and, um, and your employees are, you know, are the, are the biggest resource we have. And, you know, if, if we are to, if any company is to, to be successful in their corporate social responsibility, they have to a take care of their people. Um, but B, their, your employees need to buy in. They need to get it um, and make it, it needs to be part of their work, not just, um, you know, something that they check off on, um, you know, once a quarter. So, so that's what I would say to that question, Kim, that, that well-being and mental health, because mental health is this frontier that is so stigmatized, um, such a core critical piece of your physical health um, and it's invisible. Um, and I think that we're making a lot of progress culturally and socially to change the way we understand and engage um, with our mental health um, and in the way that the business community is bringing compassion and um, understanding to our mental health as well. So that's my answer there. I have a few more Cool questions. Um, so, so okay. So, um, Sudeshna says, could you talk a little bit about the approach adopted to align the organization's internal culture and policy with the company's positioning on social issues? So that's that's a great question. Um, so I could speak to some of, I could speak to what, you know, our establishing our corporate social responsibility um, task force, and then the way we socialized mental health um, internally in the company for about two years before we launched a campaign externally. Um, and same with, you know, with the environment, we, we wouldn't talk about, we wouldn't market it in any of our products until we really looked at our, our footprint of our building and of our supply chain. Um, but the, but I was going to ask you, what do you, um, how would you, so when, so back in the day without giving away how back, um, what, when you didn't always have a culture, you always knew what your social conscience was, you know, you wanted to use the brand, um, to address stigma, to talk about what others were, weren't talking about in a way they couldn't. Um, but you didn't impose it upon your employees. It was something you did. Um, how did you, can you speak about when you um, took that first step into welcoming your employees into this impact journey with you? Yeah, I'll do that. Um, and then what I want to do is wind up um, where we are, you know, in, yeah. the, in the heels of, um, of DE&I and, um, Black Lives Matter. But so years ago, I started doing my HIV work and a lot of people came to work at Kenneth Cole. 
um, because of that, because we were very public, I was very public about what I felt was important. And then at a certain point, I had a group of associates came to me and said, you know, we don't like that. You, we love that you do all the work that you do, but we don't love that you don't make it available to us. And I said, you know what? I didn't think I had the right to impose my personal social agenda on the on my associates. I didn't think I had the right to do it. I, and it's something that's very personal. And um, but if you feel that way. Then um, I actually had a program. I had gone to Emory University and we set up a program there, um, a fellowship on community building and social change. And one of the first graduates came on board to our company and helped set up this um, kind of an effect that um, we called the community outreach. <clears throat> and the goal was we we're gonna put in place all these programs, but nobody, we don't take attendance and you're not gonna do this to get credit. You're not gonna do this to get, to get points from me and a pat on the back. You're gonna do it because at the end of the day, you're gonna realize that you will be the biggest beneficiary of doing, doing service. And I learned that a long time ago. Um, and that the, uh, usually the provider of that service takes away more than, even than the, than the uh, recipient. So, um, and then, so we put in place these various programs. We had a mentorship program where we mentors at a school on the west side of, of, uh, of elementary and uh, preschool and first grade. And we stayed with those kids through elementary school, and um, and you know, yet you, you took you had a commitment if you're going to if you're going to mentor a child. It was a program that was run by my mother-in-law um, at the time, Matilda Cuomo, and um, so and if you are going to commit, just it's a real commitment, and you can't leave this band and this child. Very often, these children have had to deal with that um, in the ordinary course. So it was a. And but you're gonna do it for you when you're gonna do it for that child. You're not gonna get extra points here. And that's what we did over the years. So we put in place all these various programs and we allowed the associates to do it. Then at a certain point in the company, we opened up the tent and we started making these, some of what we did available to other um, stakeholders of the brand and clients. And um, in, um, in, in, in at or about uh, 1990, um, there was this pervasive problem in New York that nobody was talking about. It was called homelessness. Now, in the in the mid to, mid 80s to 90s, and homelessness was not always a social problem here in this country. It actually became one in the um, in in the late 70s, 80s during um, the Reagan Bush years when they withdrew a lot of the social safety net and. Um, uh, and then you had all these, this, this population that was totally unserved and politicians didn't support them because they didn't vote. Businesses didn't support them because they didn't consume. So we um, uh, had a business dilemma at the time because uh, in the month of February, we had already gotten rid of all of our fall, winter boots and shoes. And we transitioned to summers, what people did, because much of the country, it's starting to get warm in February, but you still want to be out every winter. So, um, but the problem is it's still 20 degrees in New York in the month of February, so everybody knows. So um, we ran an ad with a picture of a homeless person, and we said, unfortunately, too many people would love to be in your shoes. Bring in a pair that you don't wear to somebody that will, and we'll give you a discount on a new pair. So we created um, a call to action, motivating people to do what they actually we would feel good about doing in motive, inspiring them to ultimately um, consider maybe buying a pair of shoes early. But, but over the period of time, we, we collected several million pairs of shoes over the next 10, 15 so years. And, um, uh, and it was a big part of the brand's DNA and everybody took that agenda home with them. And, uh, um, and I think, uh, appreciated it and uh, helped um, helped uh, message it um, and grow it. It eventually turned into the Haiti Initiative because that was the same right after the Haiti um, earthquake that we decided to uh, focus resources there. Um, so with only a few minutes left and everyone, I, you know, I have a bunch of questions here, but definitely keep them coming. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, definitely want to make sure that we talk about the Mental Health Coalition and the, the work that we're doing. Um, I'm going to kick it over to you in a second, but just to 
reiterate a point we made about starting internally, making sure we're walking the walk and then, you know, we can talk the talk after. So we started, um, we started two years before we, we launched Mental Health Coalition a year ago. Wow, this year <laughs> flew by, huh? And for about two years, we worked to become a stigma-free um, workplace because we also realized we didn't even know how to talk about this stuff at the dinner table in our family, let alone, um, you know, in a, in a meeting. Um, and it affects everyone, you know, it affects everyone. So we became a stigma-free workplace. We had a lot, we looked at our wellness program. We looked at, um, we looked at some of our policies and um, our healthcare, et cetera, and access to mental health services. So we really, I would say that everyone who works at Kenneth Cole knows we cared about their mental health before we launched the Mental Health Coalition. Um, I hope, I hope they, they, they feel that because it's true. Um, so one year ago, I think it was, or a little less than a year ago, May 15th, I want to say was the date we launched the Mental Health Coalition. Um, can you speak some more to the progress that we've made, what we're up to now? Yeah. We're gonna, we, only have five, we only have five minutes a minute. So, but I'll tell you real briefly what we did is, the goal was to, people had asked if people, initially at NAMI actually, the largest grassroots uh, um, um, mental health service provider in the country, they asked if, if we would take on this project of looking to, to do a campaign to talk about stigma. And at the end of the day, I, I believe then like I could do now that it, it's so much bigger than that. And you need a whole new narrative, a new vocabulary and a new way you need to essentially rebrand mental health. And I'm not a public health person and, um, and I'm not a psychiatrist and I'm not a, a, a physician but, um, uh, or a clinician, but I, I, I'm, a, I'm in the perception business. It's just how I describe what we do. And I'm a good convener of resources to people. So we essentially what we did is we brought together some very creative um, people and including um, Pentagram who helped who offered to help us with some of the creative efforts um, and to put forth this new vocabulary. And then we started bringing together, I knew it had to be bigger than Ami. We, 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 today's 27 of the largest mental health service providers in the country have all joined the Mental Health Coalition. And we are totally aligned. And we've since been working closely with Facebook and Instagram who have agreed to um, use our resource library, which by the way, which is also, um, which was created by uh, Katie Cole and his sister um, who's, uh, um, who's been a big driver in this process. And, um, and uh, so if you go to, and the goal now is to ultimately, A, a new narrative, make it easier for people to kind of express themselves emotionally. It's much harder for men than it is women. And, um, and, then, uh, and then at the same time, and ultimately Mary needs these resources. So no matter where you are within a very short period of time, we're getting, making so much progress so quickly, we'll be able to, um, uh, propose resources available to you, we'll geotag you um, wherever you are. And, um, and we're very excited about, again, all of the support we're getting from everywhere that we're getting. And everybody universally recognizes that, um, that this is a very serious problem. We launched an initiative actually, which was um, uh, Katie's to our degree, Katie Cole, um, which, which in May, which when we really uh, went public with the coalition in a big way, which asks the single most asked question in every language um, in the world, almost every day of the week, and the one most rarely answered, which is how are you really? Um, and uh, so then we set up and she has, she set up a, a platform, howwereally.org, and uh, which invites people to be vulnerable and to express themselves and, and uh, discuss their struggles a little bit and they'll find comfort in the support that they're invariably gonna get and empathy where they didn't think they'd find it. Um, so, and that's the goal is to make it easy to talk about it. And what we're doing on Facebook now, we, um, we have a series of platforms that we're, we're launching some, they're out, but they're not really front and center yet. They will be shortly, um, which, which is reality checks, which we hope you could figure out how to find it. And you can find it from my platform. I'm gonna start talking about it a little bit. Um, and 
then we have these one-to-ones, which will be a, these live conversations where you'll talk to somebody who you're comfortable talking to as it, and you'll inspire other people to want to do the same. Um, and, uh, and a mental health person comes on and contextualizes everything. So, um, so we're making a massive progress on what I do believe will be maybe the biggest pandemic we've ever experienced, even much bigger than COVID is in and of itself, I do think, um, is, uh, is mental health. So um, but we're making progress. And Amanda has inspired me um, immensely throughout this journey. Um, Katie did it her way and Amanda has done it in so many ways. And, uh, and I think I blame Brown for all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I blame her Brown education um, for her willingness and her ability to think creatively, imagine what could be and, um, and, and challenge me and us to, to be better. Um, it's all, it's all Brown's fault. Brown's fault. So I've put in the chat, we put in the chat, the mental health coalition link and the, how are you really, um, dot org link as well. So please everyone check it out. Um, we are, we would love to hear from you, um, about, um, how, how these platforms, um, have impacted you any, any opportunity to collaborate. That is our MO. That's what we're here for. One plus one equals 11. So we are at nine o'clock on the dot, but I wanna give you a chance to um, leave us with any inspiring last words, words of wisdom, um, food for thought. Also, by the way, if I could, if you wanna continue the conversation, you could Instagram me or, or, um, twi- or send me a note on Twitter and I will try to respond to your questions. And I, I appreciate you allowing me to impose myself upon you um at this late hour um and uh and i hope we can uh continue i hope i can continue to be of service and support to you and uh as amanda can as well and as she is for me and with that um so i am so i'm kenneth cole real the brand is kenneth cole so ask questions share thoughts inspire me let me inspire you um, and uh, we'll go much further. Uh, I do believe, as I say, as a group, our coalition, that I think together we can make a difference, but I, but I also think only together can we really make a difference. So, and, uh, and another adage is that alone you can go fast, but together you can go far. <laughs>